Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Week with Joel, Kim and Chris. On today's Tour Catch-Up... Tsitsipas claims his third Monte Carlo crown... Raducanu leads Team GB to finals in Seville... And Rafa gets ready to return in Barcelona... Chris, today is the 15th of April and we are here to catch up on the week in tennis at Tennis Weekly HQ. We are one week into the clay season with Stefanos Sissipas returning to form with the title in Monte Carlo. Emma Raducanu leading Team GB to the BJK Cup Finals in Seville with a stunning victory in France. And it looks like we have got the green light on a Rafa return in Barcelona. Kim, how excited are you about that? I think you've forgotten something, Joel. Kim's away this week. Oh, is Kim away this week? Oh, I totally forgot about that. She is um... away, but I'm sure, she, she, I'm sure she's very pleased. Of course she's very pleased. Um, but she won't be counting her chickens too soon, knowing Kim, until he plays, until she sees how she, he's playing. I think that's what, I think yeah. that's what you've got to... You, that's the thing, isn't it, now with Rafa? It's like, until I see him... On the courts of Barcelona, I know he played a practice set against Andrew Rublev, and I know he beat him like six one, and it, all the signs were promising. But until he steps out onto the court in Barcelona in round one in the main draw, yeah, that's when the that's when the reality hits. It is, and he said it literally had to be decided today that he will play tomorrow. So for our listeners, it is today that he will be playing. And it sounds like it's day by day he's taking it, which is not particularly positive when you hear it like that. And it sounds like, you know, he might play a match here and he, he might not play another one. So any time on the court, I think will be be good for him and good for Rafa fans. Well, it's going to be very, very exciting. I'm very curious to see how he gets on. I think he's got a gentle loosener, but he could, I think, face Alex de Menor in the second round. So tough tough draw potentially um ahead we're going to be getting named to that in in a bit we're also going to be talking about andy murray's return as well as well as the queen's wta event will it happen there's lots and lots of talk to discuss as usual as chris said kim is sadly not available today so it is the 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 tennis weekly bros joel joel and chris uh, that's how, how we're known exactly uh, i've just made it up we're not the trio with the bros with the bros and uh yes we're going to be talking about all the events this week. Monte Carlo, BJK Cup ties in the first half. But before we get into all that, Chris, let's talk about what has caught your eye this week. What has been your most interesting thing that has happened in the tennis world that uh, has made you stand up at attention? Well, I mean, I'm not sure how much you're going to like this. This may have some knock-on effects and repercussions for you, Joel. But I saw today, and this is hot off the press... And I'm not sure all of us really knew this was a thing. It sounds like it's very recent. But um, Conchita Martinez is no longer um, kind of saving herself for the return of Muguruza. She's coaching Mira Andreva, which I don't, think, I don't think any of us knew about this. And um, she debuted this partnership um, on the courts of uh, Rouen today. And... She had a successful first match. She did beat Podoroska, so it's off to a good start. And in press afterwards, she said they had a one-week trial. It seemed to go well, and she hoped it went well for Conchita. And they're going to see how it goes. So very interesting, because she's coached mm. number ones in Pliskova, as well as Muguruza. But Joel, can you be happy for Mira, or are you more thinking, what does this mean for Muguruza? I can be happy for Mira, because I believe that was her first victory since the, the Australian Open. So um, very good from that front. But yeah, I do wonder how much how much can we read into this, do you think, about Garbini Muguru for the fact that she has been off the tour for so long. Um, Cochina Martin, Martinez, no longer a coach with Andriva. It does, is that a sign that, that Muguru is not coming back anytime soon? I mean, it does seem like that. I would probably say based on the enjoyment that you see over on the Muguruza Instagram channel, she's more likely to be kind of zumbering her way around Spain than she is on a tennis court. Was Martinez just fed up of, of Zumba classes? Is, is that the... I think probably like anyone who does a Zumba class, there's only so much Zumba you can do. <laughs> I'm not sure what tips she could give her as well on how to be a better Zumba instructor. So it's good to see that Conchita's found someone else to partner with and 
probably, you know, at the end of that uh, time that Muguruza was on call, I think you'd agree, Joel, it wasn't wasn't going swimming. Yeah, in. exactly. I mean, regardless of how much you, I guess, read into it about the, the mindset of Muguruza at the moment, you did feel the longer that relationship went on, the more it sort of needed to change. A little bit, I think, like, you know, the, the, with Maria Sakkari and... Um, you know how that, time yeah how that has gone and it was almost like a more of an emotional decision as well rather than kind of like you know thinking straight and um yeah maybe this misses the best and for Mira and Driva, yeah it's a very exciting it's quite fun though isn't it up. yeah I love a change like this and <laughs> I don't know Joel what's caught your attention well what has caught my attention this week has been I mean move over Netflix and Breakpoint it's now time for challenges to have its its time in the sun and we had the uk movie premiere for challenges this week and uh i i'm very i'm very much looking forward to this chris because i don't know about you i was very surprised with the reviews and how good the reviews on a whole have been for challenges um since that since the premiere it's 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 left me in shock i thought this was just going to be like wimbledon with paul bettany 2.0 but actually it sounds like it's a it's a great flick i still on the fence i have to say i have not forgotten those posters that we saw of the tennis grip that zendaya had and i'm also highly aware we're gonna need to look past pancake pancake grips pancake grip i think we have to look past and then the other thing we have to look past is the the physicality of some of the players who uh, the people that the uh, who are playing some of these tennis pros um so i'm i'm sort of on the fence still but i am very excited uh to see it i think it will be very interesting and i'm also loving for i mean kim would also be loving this but we're very much loving the looks that zende is putting together the tennis themed outfits mm. i think it's really getting a lot of focus for tennis in ways that it hasn't really crossed over i mean for a while and it could be it could be the thing joel that brings more people into the game i mean this has got to lead to some sort of zendaya x tennis uniforms at wimbledon she's, she's worn lacoste yeah yeah it, there's got to be some sort of clothing lineup partnership going on there because i think that would i think people would get involved just to wear that look it's having a moment i really do think in in fashion at the moment there is a big moment for sort of the country club look mm. i think i think it could be coming back and i think it would be great to see how this film works and I've, i saw they were in monte carlo as well <laughs> they're, they're the devil works hard zendaya on the press door works harder because they're everywhere i thought it was quite funny i saw a little clip uh, Zendaya was asked I think about like we're going to get onto it in a bit but like the the bad line calls that went against Yannick Sinner and uh, her face was just like uh yes uh it was and it was a little bit awkward I have to maybe fact check that I can say I'm pretty sure that was from the London premiere and that was a Twitter meme potentially oh, was it? potentially oh, okay. I don't know I don't know but <laughs> Um, cause I'm sure they're not allowed to speak to Zendaya at these things, but yes, very exciting. And I think we might be doing a little review of that sometime soon, mm, Joel. Yes. We're going to be at Tennis Weekly HQ bringing all the challenges, uh, all the challenges movie coverage. We didn't get, we didn't get invited to the premiere, but we're going to be covering it. So look out for that, but we're going to move on to the tennis now and we're going to move on to where Zendaya was Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo masters. The first Masters of the clay season. Stefanos Sissipas is your champion. He has now won it three times, Chris. I think there's only one player who's won it more times than him, Rafael Nadal. And in the final, he defeated Kasparud straight sets, 6-1, 6-4. I'm not going to lie, I watched a bit of this. Largely uneventful, I would say, but... This has been a real return to form, I think, for Stefanos Tsitsipas. I mean, he he was out of the top 10, I think, in in February for the first time in a long time. Um, He goes and does this on the clay courts. What is it about Monte Carlo and what is it about clay that just works so well for Stefanos Tsitsipas' game? Personally, I think he feels very at home there. I think he has a base there, which also helps. Um, I think, to be honest, it's less about the location I think it's more about how he's feeling and how he feels in the place and and where his game is at because when you watch him play, he sometimes looks a bit dejected. I think he just really lights up being there. I think he enjoys being being in this environment, which I think leads to positive results. And as far as the surface goes, uh, what Sitsipas needs is more time on the ball on that backhand. Um, On clay, you get more time to change the grip, more time to hit better returns, more time to be aggressive. 
Um, and I think that's that's why it works so well for him. And I think he also just almost seemed to have a, that ten percent more confidence than he's had previously because shots that I've not seen Sitsipas ever hit before he was making. Some of the highlights from the Zverev match, for example, I mean, to go five love up, it was unbelievable. Um, and I really just think from then he just pushed on and pushed on and pushed on. And it's a sort of belief that we all thought maybe he didn't have any more and sort of passion we weren't sure he had the conviction of. So to be honest, I think it's a case that probably his favorite place to play tennis, maybe it's, fa- maybe it's favorite place to be combined with... Um, you know, the fact that the surface really does speak to his favor. Yeah, I mean, his career at Monte Carlo, he is 36 and 7 in terms of sets played. And um, yeah, it just seems that he there's something about this venue that, that he, he really, really likes because, you know, his movement through to the final was very impressive, very straightforward. Um, had a very good win as well over Yannick Sinner in the semi-finals um, in, in three sets. And against Kasper Ruud in the final, he was just a lot more clinical when it came to those breakpoint opportunities because Sissipas was four over eight on breakpoints, but Ruud was zero and eight. And um, I was really impressed with you know his forehand He's he's got a big forehand, and if he can run around, if he can run around and and sort of protect his backhand, um, it is such a weapon. And when he comes to the net as well, I was very impressed with his touch at the net. There were some spectacular half uh, half volleys and, and volleys that um, Rude just didn't really you know have an answer answer with. But um, you know, I think what was interesting is, as I say, kind of this was he had dropped out of the top ten for the first time in in four years i mean looking at this event like how important was it for sisipas to kind of get a good result here because you know we've we've not re- he's not really been in the conversation a lot recently i think it's really important i think a lot of it probably does come down to the fact that the pressure kind of is off him in some ways because he had kind of fallen off a little bit in terms of his play i mean for example, in Miami, no one would have thought that he would have lost to uh, Shapovalov. That was obviously no. a, a really big loss in that sense. He had some decent results in Indian Wells um, and some solid results, but not the sort of results you'd expect from a player of his caliber to start the year. So you have to say he's he's really kind of shown that this is an ATP tour where there are many people who are actually competing at a very high level. I think he's shown Yannick Sinner, who's obviously the standout player of the year, that you know, he's not going to have it all his own way. The field is closer than you think to him. And kind of coming back after losing that second set, I think it's very, very, you know, impressive that he was able to get it done um, in that fashion, in a way that sometimes mm. he does mentally step away or drop off a little bit or get a bit in his head in some key situations, such as this Zverev match where he went five love up and then ended up winning it seven six. I mean, you really have to right the ship there. So I think this is so important from the mental side of things. I think it's so important from the confidence and the belief side of things because now people will really start to be considering him again as a potential candidate for the French Open. And this clay season, I think it will really be about making his claim back on the fact that he is one of the greatest talents of, of his generation. And it's about time probably that he, he kind of gets those results again. He has served us a reminder of of his credentials, and another player who has served a reminder of their credentials is Casper Ruud, a you know a French Open men's finalist. Um, you know, he he got to the final here, had a stunning win against Novak Djokovic in the semi finals. Didn't really bring it together in the final, and you know as a result of that, we're still he still hasn't won a tournament. I think above. 250 he is yet to break the 250 barrier but I mean just just talking about Rude how again similar question how impressed were you with his tennis this week and were you surprised he wasn't able to bring the level he showed against you know Novak Djokovic into the final I think with Casper watching him last week train and practice and when he was playing very well you see the sort of game where he can do all sorts of damage to you with different heights to the ball, different spins. He can be aggressive. He can do an awful lot with his game. And he kind of talked about when we spoke to him that he does rush himself at times. And I think he rushes himself sometimes on the serve. I think he also sometimes rushes when it comes to those break points, for example. He doesn't always have the most clarity of thought in those big, big moments. And to be honest, I think... He doesn't always get off to the quickest start. It's very much Casper's honor is off, I think. And at times in this one, it, it did feel like he was a little bit off the mark. 
I don't think it was the occasion. I think he just wasn't playing his his best tennis on the day. And he almost had chances where, you know, I think he really did say that he should have probably got one of the breaks back um, or got a break, sorry, at, at the start of that second set. So I think with Casper, is, he really is always an unknown quantity because the talent level we've talked about is, is there. Mm. He's reached more major finals than anyone else outside of, um, I think it's team and then, uh, I mean, he's so take. up and down at Grand Sand, he isn't is. he, from, from one to the next. It was the, it, what was it, first round to a final was basically how <laughs> yes. his whole thing was working. And it is, it is a bit mad, obviously seeing him last week losing a 250 mm. semi-final, then beat Djokovic the following week. You mean he lost to the world number 77 and then he beat the world number one and greatest of all time. So I think it really just showed, just showed that each week is a different week. And one week, it might be your week. Like Sitsapas, it's his week. Rude, it's his week this week. And... I think it leads to the question when it comes to the draws later, whose week will it be next week? Because it is really a case where um, there are big, big opportunities, despite Sinner's sort of dominance Mm. at the start of this season. Well, one player who's probably thinking, when is it going to be my week is Novak Djokovic. Because, Chris, I could could give you stats that, that paint the picture that he had a good... Uh, you know Monte Carlo. He hadn't been in the semi-finals of of Monte Carlo for a, for a long, long time. But having said that, uh, you know his his body language on on the court, that double fault on match point. There were a lot of things that still made me think. Like, yes, there are there are times where maybe I thought, oh my god, the real Djokovic is back. But actually, by the end of the tournament, I was still kind of in a position of. Will, will the real Novak Djokovic still stand up? And in press afterwards, he was very brutal about himself in terms of he's had probably one of the worst you know starts to the seasons he's had in, in his entire career. I mean, what what is what is going wrong? You know, with with Novak Djokovic's his game at the moment, and are you surprised? It's I know he's only played like I think it's it's three tournaments this, this season, but are you surprised we're still kind of talking about this? You know, going into the clay season in April when you know the season obviously started in January I think he, he hasn't spent that much time on the tennis court I think we all thought he probably would have done something either at Indian Wells or Miami obviously he didn't end up playing Miami so that's probably more the shock to me I think he's he has lost early here before obviously he lost to Massetti last year so I'm not going to read too much I thought into that was going to happen again well I mean Massetti really he was leading he had great opportunities to do it and um, I think he did get a little bit in his head in those moments mm. but um, for me, I think it's just definitely a case that he's he's just not as match fit as he used to be and not from a fitness perspective, but more in terms of, you know, the Osaka thing of not seeing the return in the way that he normally does. I think he was warming up this tournament to seeing it in the way he used to and kind of return in the way that we know that he can. But people are getting a few more cheap points here and there and they are getting a few more, few more doubles. There's a few more um, return errors that he's making. In a way that, I mean, you got no free points off the return against Novak Djokovic previously. So mm. I think he's fine tuning his way through the season. I think, again, a semi final. Obviously, he lost um, in a big sort of surprise earlier this. Uh, well, I mean, in the last match that he played was obviously a big surprise. So I think. Are you still worried for his game and where he's at? Um, am I worried for his game? I'd say I'm not sure what it looks like for Djokovic if people think they can beat him and I do think that he has that he's lost that not saying that he hasn't lost the respect of the locker room he's lost that cloak of invincibility I do think when Casper stepped on the court I think he thought you know what some of the guys that beat beat him Mm -hmm. in this year I mean Nadi for example I'm gonna have chances yeah and I think that's probably the way that people are looking at it now. Doesn't mean that you're going to win. Doesn't mean you're going to be able to go through with it like Massetti. Mm. Um, and doesn't mean Djokovic won't raise his level. But if you are facing him, say, round two in Rome, I think you're probably going to think, let's have a good go at this. Yeah, I agree. And I think you know, I watched a, I watched the, the Djokovic versus the Menor match. And although Djokovic came out of that with a straight sets victory, I think that was more that de Menor wasn't, playing to some of the, the levels of tennis he has played this season because I thought that was an opportunity for him to 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 claim a famous victory and I wonder if Kasper Ruud was looking at that and thinking yeah you know this guy has won but he he is there for the taking he is not the Novak Djokovic of old and perhaps he has got a little that that chink in his armor is certainly there I think to be you know exploited by players who 
are on the top of their game. And, and as, as Kasper Ruud proved, um, he was able to do that and get to the finals. So um, and if yeah. you hang in there, right, if you hang in there, you're going to have more chances than you have done when you faced mm. them previously. And I think, um, you know, with, with Kasper breaking to, to win the match on a double fault, I mean, to be honest, based on seeing some of the matches Kasper has or hasn't been able to close out, you'd think, I mean, Kasper said I was praying for a double fault. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd think there was no way that he'd get that. Mm. And he double faulted on match point, which is very, very uncharacteristic. But I have to put the question to you, Joel. So in terms of his clay court season coming up, most likely the next time we'll see him play will probably be in Rome, probably unlikely for Madrid. Um, I don't think he, he particularly likes to play both of them in the lead up to the French. Um, Rome, do you think that he's going to bring it together in Rome or do you think the French Open or how do you see this going for him? I I can't at the moment I I can't I can't see it getting better. I think it's actually going to get more and more difficult because the pressure is going to amp up even more the closer we get to you know a, a second grand slam opportunity and and you know that is what he's about. He wants to win more grand slam titles and at the moment the tennis we're seeing on the court is just not you just wouldn't say I think it's Grand Slam champion winning tennis and there are actually other players in the draw who you know can make the most of that I mean you know Yannick Sinner is the number one form player I think on the on the tour at the moment so I'm a I'd still I still think there's a lot of cause for concern there I think it obviously makes sense to play Rome not Madrid given the, the conditions of Madrid are very different I think to, to Roland Garros but um yeah, it's it's going to be. I think it's going to be tough, and I and uh, it's it's a bit of a weird state of affairs. I think at the top of the rankings with Alcaraz and Djokovic, you know, one's a little bit injury prone at the moment. Alcaraz has, has dropped out of Barcelona. Um, Djokovic not really playing the tennis. We know um, their seat <laughs> their seeds are a little bit vulnerable. I think it does. It feels like this season. Um, almost like last season when we had kind of the changing of the guard where Djokovic actually had the slams, mm. but Alcaraz was number one for a period of time. And now it seems like it's almost take a look at the race instead. You know, the race is saying that Sin is the standout player of the year, obviously. It'll be some time before he's able to overtake Novak Djokovic if he does continue to play very well. But then you've got kind of a, a real mix of players. And I'd say right now it's probably the most open that it will be going into a Grand Slam um, I think Sinner on clay, we've got some question marks. We haven't seen what his form will be like across the yeah. clay court season. He is a very good mover on clay. Um, and he's obviously played a lot on clay when he's younger. But I do think then that there's probably 10 players that you really could see having a very deep run or potentially coming away with the title in Paris, which I think normally we, we don't look. And I think Kim and I especially, we don't look beyond Djokovic because we, we know what he's able to do and what he can do. But I mean... It's not going to make predictions easier, is it, Joel? No, it's not. It's, it feels very, very open. I mean, we know, I know we're very early on into the clay season, but it does feel very, very open. And Sissipas certainly has announced himself. I mean, just a couple of other talking points from Monte Carlo. A, a talking point I think we always talk about when it comes to the clay season, line calls and mm. specifically bad line calls because... This was a theme, I feel, I feel throughout uh, the week in Monte Carlo. We had a few, I would say, shocking moments, um, you know, that did not benefit players like Yannick Sinner, Daniel Medvedev. Holger Rune. And Holger Rune. Um, what do you make of these, these moments? Because I feel like we, every season we talk about we've got the technology but at the same time, it's not being implemented and we just get people looking at marks on a, on a tennis court and it looks a bit, it can look a bit silly. Sometimes we don't actually get the right decision and these can happen in really pivotal moments of matches like in the sinner semi semifinal. It's surely got to change at some point. I think it's definitely kind of a, a moment in tennis where I think we're all just looking at these replays and we see what the actual mark was and we see the ball was not the way that the umpire called it or if it was even the right mark. It really is a case where... Well, what were they looking at? I really don't know what they were looking at and it is this human error side of things and maybe it's a case that umpires feel the pressure that they, they don't want to say they don't know which one the mark is. Um, 
but umpires are getting it really wrong. We saw it as well in the, the Billie Jean King Cup, which we'll talk about later, with a Radicanu mark, a completely different mark that they went to. And, I mean, it's a bad run for umpires. There's been a lot of bad looks, I think, in, in this year in terms of some of the judgments that have been made about certain things, and especially when it comes to the line calls and, and some of the judgments in Monte Carlo. I mean, it's just... You have the technology. Should it be compulsory? Because I know we've, I think we've had, you know, things like Fox 10, which is a Hawkeye equivalent being used, I think, in, in Madrid. Um, but Monte Carlo seemingly, it's just like, wants to be on the more classical, traditional side of things. But should it be mandated or, or made compulsory at such premier clay events to have some sort of line technology in place? I mean, based on what I've seen this week it can't be uh, any worse i mean absolutely i think as i was going to say that someone on their couch has seen the correct call and that's not what's happened in the match and i always believe when it comes to umpiring that you shouldn't actually have an impact on how the match goes the whole point is you facilitate but you don't actually impact it or make your stance so much so that it actually does impact how people perform in the match, whether that's annoying a player who then gets fired up like Holger Runa was at what I thought was a very bad decision when it came to um, giving him a warning for un- unsportsmanlike conduct or behavior because he was kind of doing a, a mouthing symbol with his hands at the crowd, like saying, keep talking, basically. Um, and he didn't swear, didn't say anything for that. And he got a warning there. And you just think, everyone has sort of lost the plot with this. It doesn't really make sense with any of it. And, you know, we're seeing the supervisors being called and they aren't, they aren't doing anything about it. Um, and previously, we thought the supervisors really did have a good role in it. So I almost feel yeah. like I'm a bit disenchanted with umpires, supervisors and the judgments because they're either going too hard in one direction or not hard enough in the other. And then they're not just doing the base job because they're firing up players to do better than they did. They're changing the scores of matches. And I ultimately just think there's no, they've got to be repercussions for this because we've seen some bad decisions. Uh, yeah, it doesn't feel like well. any, any accountability um, yeah. you know, at the moment. I'm, I know, for example, in like the, the Premier League in football, the referees are, are, much, are very much under you know, pressure and scoring and, and their performances are rated. And I don't know if, if, if that happens on, on you know, the tennis tours. But yeah, we've had a few clangers particularly this week and I, I'm going to give Stefanos Sissipas the final say on it because on his social media he said watching tennis players argue with the umpire is like watching me try to convince my GPS I know a shortcut so <laughs> maybe wow. it sounds like to me when I read that I was like did did Yelena Ostapenko hack into Stefanos Sissipas's account and write that well, I've heard that she's a very speedy driver, so I'm pretty <laughs> sure that she would also think that she knew the way better mm. than a GPS, that's for sure. But, I mean, what would your take be in terms of, I think it should be used, if the technology is being used to tell us at home, it really should be used, or they should the umpire should be able to review to see if they got the right mark. I think that definitely should be something, because the supervisor would be coming on court knowing that the court was wrong, for example. Mm. I think personally that the technology is there is there. I think they should be using it. And to me this week showed it as I say, it can't get any worse. So we need to make it better. Technology I think can make it better. I understand that there's still a degree of in- inaccuracy related to the technology, but as I say, I don't think it's as it's it's as worse as what we're getting at the moment and yeah i do think things you know need to be changed i will say one thing though about monte carlo before we move on is i have enjoyed the fact that this masters event has just been over one week oh, uh, instead it's so of lovely. two it's it's like the format of it and and just getting through tennis in one week there's something very clean about it um and it definitely helps the tennis weekly schedule I, but it really does. And it's, we are tennis weekly, you know, we aren't tennis masters too weekly. It really yeah. doesn't work like that. So <laughs> I think um, it's so nice that they do kind of pack it in this way. And, you know, players are fine with it. They're even playing doubles. Yeah. It's just a shame, though. I Well, obviously, the, you know, the move feels to me that it's going towards the, the two week format at the, the premier level. And uh, yeah, it's a shame because it does feel a bit bit bloated i think at, at times and i think this was just a reminder of that so um yeah i just hope we don't lose these masters one week events but unfortunately i feel like we might do um 
Anyway, right, let's move on. Billie Jean King Cup ties the finals in Seville later this year. We know our finalists and uh, GB are going to be one of them because we defeated France away from home 3-1. Emma Raducanu putting on an absolute show. I was a little bit nervous after that first rubber where Katie Balter got, uh, well, she got absolutely thrashed, didn't she, by diane Paris, but uh chris what did you make of the what did you make of the tie um because i believe last week you thought this was going to be a france victory it's funny you remember that joel but um <laughs> sorry kim thought it was going to be a france victory as well i was well. going to say both of us Clarif- did thank to you thank you we're in it together <laughs> i will be speaking defending both of us kim okay. and myself on this i think you know it's very tight it's very close i think it really was kind of on uh the toss of a a coin at the end of that you know which way will that tie break go and the doubles could have been very different so that's in my defense but i think it's also i mean it was a lot of unknowns with katie bolter especially first time playing a tour level Mm -hmm. match on clay she's played grand slams but never a tour level i didn't i didn't realize she's she's uh she's not won a tour level She's not won a tour level match on clay or on the WTA tour, I believe. She hasn't played a match on the WTA she tour played. on clay. Wow. Yeah, so it, it, really unknown quantity. And obviously losing that one, losing the last 12 games of that, essentially a double bagel. I mean, at the end of that, and then when Raducanu went down a set against Garcia, I think we all thought, oh goodness, this is going to be over quickly. Mm. But we shouldn't have doubted because the story of the match was actually that Emma Raducanu come back from behind victory in, in both of her matches. And... I was watching it and I absolutely love watching her play tennis and I love watching her play on clay because it felt like it's the perfect surface for her in so many ways because she is a problem solver. She's got a very high tennis IQ and it was just nice watching an Emma Raducanu who looked like in those crunch moments that she was composed, she really backed herself and she had real grit and I just think it was honestly so refreshing to see her and I think this will be such a big moment for her and probably one of the big positive moments since winning that US Open where... The press hopefully will get back behind her. She's got the support of her team. She's back in that environment. And this will be a real springboard to more success for her. But, I mean, fantastic from her. And I, I do think, as she said herself, this is actually the best that she thinks she's played. Mm. She's playing at her the best level um, that she has played at, including sort of the US Open. So I think we've got some very promising signs. And even from Katie Boulter on clay, actually, Joel. Well, yeah, I mean, it was a big call, I think, from Anne Kiofovong to stick, you know, with you were, Katie You were texting Balter. me Fran Jones. Well, yeah, I mean, Fran Jones had had, you know, very good, uh, you know, clay results in, in South America had come in. And given, as I say, the result that, that Paris served up to Balter to and love in that first rubber, I thought there might be consideration of a change. But Anne Kiofovong, to her credit, held her nerve kept Balter in against Clara Burrell and uh, you know came through 756 love so that was very impressive i mean j- just on on Raducanu a lot of a lot of people can talk about clay as like her worst surface um the one she looks most uncomfortable with but i think that's a bit unfair because you know we we spoke about her, her results in and she's playing you know Stuttgart this week but her results in Stuttgart um last season where you know she had she went on a on a, on a very decent run there um the season what is before it? last sorry the season yeah. before last i mean what is it do you think about clay that can suit you know radicanu's game and, and make her a threat on the tour well as i said i think she's a really good problem solver and there's a lot of point construction and she really does understand how to play the game um she's a great mover i think she moves really well on clay and she's very um able to a hit passing shots. I mean, genuinely, I think it suits her game better than grass. If mm. I'm, if I'm honest, I think wow. we saw that when she was sort of struggling a little bit for form post U.S. Open. When, as you say, she made that quarterfinal where she did kind of test Iga Swiatek while she was in the middle of her, her winning run um, with a pretty tight match there, and then she came on to Madrid and made the fourth round there before she went out to you know Kalinina, who's a very good clay court player, a Masters finalist previously. So she's definitely got some caliber there. And she's one of those players who, you know, she's got all of the shots in her armory. The drop shot worked beautifully. The slice is working very well. Um, The serve is really working on this. I think she's really working on the slice and the kick serve on the surface. So I actually think it's probably the surface, which you might think wouldn't be her best surface, but actually really could be and could grow to be one of her best Mm. surfaces. 
Yeah, and I do think the conditions helped a little bit because it was an indoor clay. It looked like on the faster side of, of, of clay courts I've seen anyway. And uh, I certainly felt like that suited her game. So, um, yeah, it was very... And Bolter's. And Bolter's, Bolter's game. You, yeah. I loved what Bolter said. It reminded me of Sharapova after she'd lost that first one and won the next one she played. She said, I don't know why I came out here and tried to play clay court tennis. She's like, I've never played <laughs> yeah. clay court tennis. I've just got to play, just got to play my game, you You've know? Got to, you just got to play your game regardless of the, of the surface. Play and, it like um, a hard court. It was, it was a quick, it was a quick court. And um, yeah, I think that was uh, the thing that, that sort of helped them come through. I mean, looking at all the other ties that went on, we were sort of starved, I'm not going to lie, of, of a bit of drama. I mean, it was, what, Poland 4, Switzerland 0, Australia 4, Mexico 0. I think the, mo- the biggest story out of that was Ash Barty was there with her baby watching on. Yes, it was. That was so nice to see her. And <laughs> you said to me before we started recording, oh, is she? I was she, like, she, ca- she? She, she can't get rid of the itch. She, I think, like, she loves tennis and wants to watch it and... I would love to know what was going through her mind whilst watching that, whether she was thinking, oh, I could I could still I mean, do a job on a tennis court. I mean, especially when you look at the fact that they were not at full strength mm. at all, Australia. Um, no, no. So I do think that if she picked up a racket, I think she probably would have picked up three rubbers, but she didn't need <laughs> yes. to because it was so one-sided yes. anyway. Um, I mean, we had also Japan come through with Naomi Osaka, uh, 3-1 against Kazakhstan. Um, and we also had Slovakia 4, Slovenia 0, USA 4, Belgium 0, and Germany 1 away from home in Brazil 3-1. But Chris, probably the most dramatic tie apart from GB France was Ukraine-Romania, where Romania were 2-0 down and won 3-2. It's just the ninth time in Billie Jean King Cup history that a team has done that um, and won in the best of five format, which has been adopted since 1995. Um that was a very impressive win, particularly because, I mean, there was no Simona Hallett there. 2-0 um, down, Anna Bogdan against Alina Svitolina. You're thinking that's that's a done deal. You really are definitely thinking that would be a done deal. Um, really quite shocking, to be honest. Especially, I think, maybe it's the pressure side of things with it being kind of run by the Alina Svitolina Foundation. There's a lot of pressure. It's almost like an event that she's hosting as well as playing and leading her team and playing for her country so important mm. to her. So I think it is a case where, you know, you see these results. And I think Ostapenko said when she was losing to players who were almost 200 in the world on the tour, these girls would never beat me, um, which I think is actually probably quite pertinent because, I mean, they wouldn't even be in a situation where they could play her. So they haven't played tennis that would get them into that position. So I think with this one, it was a case of a bit like when we saw... And I think it was in Glasgow where, you know, GB needed to win a match 3-0. It can really fire you up. It can mm. really make you realise when you're back against yeah. the wall, you can play your best tennis. And it seems like it's almost like a bit of a Romanian trait because we've seen, I mean, Cristea this year and, and last year. I mean, she's been saving match points here and there. It feels like there's a real resilience there. So very, very impressive to come through. And you have to say they're only going to get stronger because you add in a Cristea and you add in a Simona Halep. And you've got a very formidable two singles players who could be playing in Seville later this year. Definitely. And I mean, there was a lot on the line in in these ties because we've got the Olympics coming up. And this was basically some of the last experience um, doubles players can get um, in order to play, even play the the Olympics. So it was kind of fascinating from that perspective of of almost kind of using this as a setup. for trying to qualify. You know, some players have to play and they haven't played yet. For example, Naomi Osaka... She very much had to play um, in order to stake her claim because currently she hasn't played. I don't think she's played the amount that you would need to to qualify yourself to play. So it's a bit like they're trying to make the case that they should be there. Make Seville, but also make Paris at the same time. Exactly, exactly. I think it's, um, (laughs) you know, also doing a solid to your, your national tennis committee to make sure that they know that you're still serious about it. And the field is set for Seville. We have 12 countries staking their claim for the Billie Jean King Cup title. Australia, Canada, Czech Republic, Great Britain, Germany, Italy, Japan, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Spain and USA. I mean, where do you start with those participants and how do you think GB will fare? Well, GB, arguably, they're only going to be better on a hard court, I think, even though I mean, Raducanu is as good on clay as she is on hard. And Katie Boulter is a 500 titleist. So 
you really think that that's going to favor favor them that the surface will be really good for them i mean having a grand slam champion and top 30 player in your team yep. is going to put you in good stead i think other t- other sides that are always good we know that the czech republic are, are always um very dangerous i think australia probably won't quite be as competitive this year probably you're looking at poland with magda Lynette and Iga on tech and the us i think it's probably the us should be getting this they've had some really poor results at this tournament um given the strength they have in depth so i mean it's all to play for and it actually sets itself up as probably um one of the most exciting lineups we've had well, we will see. <laughs> we're excited. We're sort of talking about, shall we go? Shall we go? Should, should we, we make a trip? Mm, trip out to Spain for Seville? We'll have to ask Kim. She's not here to approve. Yeah, exactly. We need to, we need to get approval from Kim first. But um, yeah, we shall see. But we're going to take a quick break now. But do join us in the second half where we will be discussing used courts, potentially stopping a Queen's WTA event taking place. Andy Murray's promising injury update. And we take a look at this week's events, including Stuttgart and Barcelona where Rafael Nadal is set to return, so do not go anywhere. Welcome back to the Tennis Weekly Podcast, and now we're going to move on to a little quiz, a little quiz, and actually, I am the one not giving the quiz today. Uh, Chris, I do believe you have a mysterious player for me. I do indeed. It's been a while since I've had to prepare one of these. It's been a while not giving one. I ha- honestly, and I think <laughs> definitely the last one we did was, I think it was Roman Safulin. So I I have tried to make it so that you are definitely able to get this Okay. Um, in the first few goes. But Thank I also, I, I'm trying to make it hard enough that you also feel like the punishment for the Joel's games that you've been putting Kim and I through <laughs> recently. So... For our listeners who have not played along with us before, the name of the game is Mysterious Player. I will reveal a series of clues, and after each clue, Joel will have to be put on the spot and guess who is this mysterious player. So do play along at home, um, guess along at home, and then let us know if you got it before Joel and how many clues you needed to get it. I feel like up to this moment, as quiz master, I can sort of cower behind just being the quiz master and asking the question. So you I'm do a ask bit, good questions though. So I'm, I'm a little yeah. bit nervous now the shoes on the other foot and I'm, I'm the one giving the answers. Well, don't worry. Or We're in safe, to. safe ground here. It's <laughs> it, almost your specialist subject. Okay. So we will kick off. Are you ready? In traditional fashion, the first clue for Joel and listeners at home. I was born on the 29th of April, 1987. Ooh, okay. So a few years older than me. So 97, 07, 17, uh, 33, 30, coming up to 37. So are they still playing tennis? That's um, honestly the best math you've ever done with one of the data know, we've given you. On Normally the spot, you're like, they're 31, on the spot, 34. They're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. 44. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they're active. No, I'm joking. I'm going to say, I know I know this player is around. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's maybe a bit too general. I'm going to say Andy Murray. I can tell you that I'm going to have to keep going. It is not Andy Murray. I have won the Fed Cup, now known as the Billie Jean King Cup, three times. Interesting. So it is a female player who may or may not be retired or ver- or verging on retirement. Fed Cup. Hmm. It could also be a doubles player. Um, I'm going to think recently retired. Um Three, oh. What nationality could have won it three times is where I'd start, Joel. Oh, that's a good point. I'm just pleased you've like realised it was a female player. <laughs> or Russia. Mm. Maria Sharapova? It's not a bad guess. Not a bad guess. But I will continue. I have completed the career Grand Slam in doubles. Ooh, now we're talking career grand slam in doubles hmm fed cup i don't think this is right 
Bethany Matic Sands. That is an. These are all good guesses this week, but I have to say we have to continue. Ah, I reached the finals at Roland Garros in singles and doubles in 2012. Okay. Singles and doubles, 2012. Big year for tennis. Big year for you know the UK. Yeah. Yeah. The it's Olympics. Olymp- Olympics. Yeah. Um. Trying to think who would have won Roland Garros 2012 ladies singles champion. I don't think this is right because I don't think Italy won it three times. I'm going to say Francesca Schiavone. I'm going to have to continue. Oh. And this is my final clue. Are you ready? (laughs) Okay. I can also give you an extra clue if you'd like, but my doubles partner... Was Roberta Vinci? Oh, well, I think I know now who it is, and I think they're still playing on the tour. I think actually they qualified to play in Stuttgart this week. Is it Sara Irani? It is Sara Irani. Hey, there we go. There we go. A lovely reminder of just how much she's achieved in tennis that I don't think we actually give her that much credit for, Joel. I, I yeah, I need to give her more credit, I think. That that is definitely Career deserved. Grand Slam in doubles, completely forgot about yeah. that. Grand Slam singles as well, also had a very good career. That is having a very good career. She also this was a stat I didn't include, she managed to qualify in singles and doubles two years in a row for the end of season finals, twenty twelve and twenty thirteen. Wow. So fair play, fair play. Very impressive. Do let us know, listeners, how you did. Did you get Sarah Irani before Joel? <laughs> did you get it from the date of birth? Strange things have happened. Chris, I'm curious, what was the final clue? Was it going to be their surname ends in Irani? <laughs> it was actually just going to... I was just going to basically tell you and just say it was... Um, <laughs> uh, they were banned Oh, uh, okay. for eating lasagna. Is that what they officially <laughs> officially claim? And I don't I think that... I would have got it from that. So I'm, oh, I'm really? kind of, I'm, okay, a sigh good. of relief. I think I got it from the. Imagine that I did, if I but, say uh, that, and you're like, "Well, yes. that could be a number of people." <laughs> I, I think they might be Italian. <laughs> well, listeners, let us know how you got on in mysterious player. But we're going to move on to the tennis weekly mailbag now. And actually, we have a special guest joining us. It is, it is Kim. Kim has joined us for mailbag, and this is the question that Kim has given to me and Chris. Hi, Joel and Chris and everyone listening. Uh, Sorry, I can't be there today. I'm off in the West Country, uh, sunning it up uh, down in Bristol. However, I do have a mailbag question. Uh, You both know, uh, and our listeners will know, that I'm not a fan of players behaving badly, but it seems like they were unfortunately at it again in Monte Carlo. So do you think this is a trend that's creeping in? And and where do you stand on the whole debate between it makes for good TV and it's dramatic versus it just shouldn't be tolerated at all? Uh, It'd be really good to know your thoughts on this particular one. Thank you. Well, I understand both sides of the argument, but I do think that we have reached a point where it's gone too far on some of the behavior front. I think with the Rublev outburst that we see, I think with some of the swearing that we've seen on court, I think with Medvedev almost threatening to break the the sun guard that he had over his head, I think it's it's just getting ridiculous. And I have to point out that it is all men who are behaving badly and it is grown men who are all behaving badly. And we can't write any of these off as being young and inexperienced. I think Holger Rune is way beyond that now. I actually don't think he behaves that badly generally. I think, to be honest, it's a case a lot of things were going against him that didn't really make sense at the time. And there were rulings that didn't seem to be completely fair. But I mean, overall, it's almost like they they know they're being filmed. They're acting up to the crowd or the TV audience. I think it does feel a bit like that. And so I would say I don't mind a little bit of drama on a tennis court. You know, someone being a bit annoyed about a line call can add to a bit of um, excitement when watching it. it can fire people up. But at the same time, I do think it is going too far. And I want to watch these role models behave in a way role models do. Um, 
because they are highly decorated champions, a lot of them, and they don't behave like that. They sometimes behave like little boys. Yeah, I... You I love it, it. I love it. I love <laughs> it. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I love it. I think it makes great TV. Yes, I agree. I think it can be dialed down a little bit, but I think without it, tennis would be... It'd be more boring. It'd be less entertaining. And I think characters sell the sport and we want to see those personalities. And arguably, fans are not going to see these personalities off the court as much as they do on the court and that's just the i think that's just the nature of 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 tennis and um i I think it's you know i think over best of three best of five it is expected i think it's not just going to be a flat (laughs) flat uh flat emotion all the way through so i want to see that i want to see it expressed um and yeah, do you think it helps just, the game sometimes? Do you think it helps them elevate their level, do you think, at times? I think, it's for, getting some, a bit... I think for some players it does. And I think you know there are classic examples of that. I think obviously John McEnroe is up there. Um, you know, Novak Djokovic is as part as of well. the history of the sport in some ways, yeah. I guess. But... I do think you know, with some players it, it has the complete you know, opposite effect and it, it almost overwhelms them. Like you know, Nick Kyrgios, for example, it's almost been, I think, like a blocker to you know, him achieving perhaps more success than you know he has it you know uh, currently so yeah i think to me i think it's fine i think it's a bit of theater i i do get that it can come across really aggressive and i do think there is a a line there and i don't like when that line is crossed but i'd rather have it in there than not at all are we closer to the line than we have been recently with the trend element yes. of the question I do mm. think I do think we I do think we have been and We're seeing more things that make me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, and it's from more it's not just from like one or two players, it's it's getting more and more now and and sometimes I wonder with, you know, the advent of of social media and what people know is going to perform well as content on on social media channels. I wonder if also like they just get shared more because there's more talkability around them. I think more general fans get involved with the the conversation, um, and as a result, I feel like it, it, it yeah, perpetuates it's... the situation. Exactly, yeah. Well, Kim, that is your answer. We there all know how go. Kim feels about it. She wants people to behave better. That is for sure. We just want Rafa and Roger role models uh, across the the whole of the ATP rankings, don't we? Just clone them as a behavior model. Let them teach the class ATP discipline. Mm. Um, your teachers are <laughs> Mr. Federer and Mr. Nadal. <laughs> well, I mean, moving on to some talking points from the week. We haven't really had any kind of earth-shattering news, I would say, but we've had some very positive updates from the Andy Murray camp because Andy Murray will not be having surgery on his ankle. There's been no date given to his return, but he is out of the walking boot and it is hoped he will be hitting the court again soon. So... I mean, maybe it's the hope that kills you, but um, I, I'm not gonna lie. I'm so, I was fearing the worst, but now I'm sort of like, oh, could he, could he get back in time for the the grass court season? It's great news, either way you look at it. I think we all thought it could be a career ender, and especially at this point of his career, where he was already kind of talking about whether he was still finding the joy in tennis. So, I mean, the man is remarkable in his desire to play the sport and to go out in his own way. And he said whether he's on one leg and what was it? One leg, one ankle, one Metal hip, one wrist, whatever he, whatever he has, he will be able to, to show Wimbledon again, I think. So I'm really hoping that he will be able to to play on the grass. I think this is not necessarily an update that we thought we would see. I think I personally thought that maybe he wouldn't get the Wimbledon sort of farewell he might be hoping for um but you know we'll have to see he doesn't want to play much past the summer but hopefully a bit like Nadal he'll get his crescendo and, and his final farewell at his well most successful grand slam and home slam in this case I mean another talking point that broke today uh, was around the Queen's WTA event which um has been talked about and mooted for next year. Now, some interesting news has come out that has basically said that the Queen's WTA event can happen, but the L- the ATP need to give approval um, because there's a little bit of worry that the Queen's ATP event, which would follow the WTA event, would be on used courts, and they're worried about the, the deterioration there, how it's going to work with players. Um, 
this is sort of quite interesting from my perspective because it's like a women's event is going to be decided if it runs or not based on what ultimately what what the men are saying i mean it doesn't read well does it i think i, I get i sort of get i i, I do I get, the point, get it yeah the, the heritage of queens and it being a men's tournament first obviously there's no real need for it to have a a women's event when there is obviously eastbourne and there is a very good calendar right now when it comes to um the grass court tennis but I mean, we've all seen at Wimbledon, the final gets played on what is mm. essentially dry mud. Dust bowl. Yeah. Exactly. So um, I think it, it would be a bit precious if they were to say no. But you have to, I guess, understand that there will be a deterioration in the quality of the course. But if I was an ATP player, I would say it's actually better because you're less likely to slip on the courts, which has been a big problem. You know, on the, on the first time that people hit the courts, they are more slippery. There's less grip. So if anything it would purely be from like a, an aesthetic perspective. And in which case, then we all just need to to get on with it. Because like Scott mm. Lloyd says, I mean, of course you can play on them for two weeks. I mean, people play on grass courts across across the summer. Um, it's not like a, a one tournament and done necessarily option. So I don't know. What do you think, Joel? Do you think that it would be a very bad look if they were to say no? Uh, I think I think it's great that, the well... Assuming that they're going to get kind of player involvement and hear their views, I think is, is good. It's not just, I guess, a like business decision. Um, I would like to see the women's event take place, and and as you said, maybe it'll actually help the bed in the courts before they, you know, actually get used on the ATP side of things. I think the only thing I sort of have a sort of optics concern about is the fans that are going to go to the ATP event. Um, I know the tickets for Queens are. It can be very, very expensive. And um, I could just see potential headlines being like, you know, fans paying lots and lots of money for, for, for tickets to watch high quality tennis and they're playing on used tennis courts. Um, so that's, yeah, the, I guess, yeah. And the pictures won't look as good. <laughs> mm, that's, I guess that's the, you know, that's the, that's the kind of worry. And I think, I think that's the challenge with, you know, uh, particularly with grass courts events where it's all around prestige and making it feel special and unique. And, you know, if there is a lead up event to, you know, to the ATP event and you've not got a quick turn, you know, you've not got a quick change around, um, it's not like you have a year to get it ready. You've, yes, you've got, you've got like 50 weeks to get it ready and then you've got a WTA event and then you've maybe got like, a, I don't know, a couple of days or whatever to get it properly ready. So, mm. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's it's kind of tricky, but I sort of expect it to go. I sort of expect it to go through. Yeah, I'm. A, but I'm a little bit against it in the sense I don't really want to compromise too much the existing calendar. So mm. maybe I'm biased, um, but I also think there would be no grounds really to say no. Yes. Well, we shall see. We'll see what the decision. We'll see what the decision is. I feel like it might get announced around when when Queens happens. Who knows? I don't know. But um, let's move on because we do have some events to look forward to this week. And Chris, we've got to start Barcelona Open. Rafa is returning. It is confirmed. Carlos Alcaraz is not going to be there. But yeah, Rafa Nadal is back. He's got Flavio Caboli in the first round. Could face Alex de Menor in the second round are we just excited to have Rafa back I'm just excited he's at a tournament and he said he's going to play it I think that's very very exciting mm. and it's confident um, yeah it's it definitely a positive sign for me I'm also looking in the draw at Rublev he's got a point mm. to prove at the moment can he break the three match losing streak can he not lose a set 6-4 which is what he's lost his last six sets so I think that will be interesting to see. And there is a, it's a very, very tasty 500. We haven't had a 500 like this for a while, which has really been this stack. It's a and really big draw for a 500. It's a big draw. I actually was looking at the prize money and it's, it's a big, big prize money. So I think they're definitely, um, definitely staking their claim, you know, for the Barcelona 500 to be a, a staple fixture on the tour as it always has been. Um, but no, I think it will be interesting. I'm also, I've also i got my eyes elsewhere, of course. You know where my eyes will definitely be. They actually <laughs> were already over in Rouen. I've been over there. Oh, watching, really? Um, Sloane Stevens. I mean, Sloane Stevens won today, didn't she? She did. She took out Peyton in three sets. Mm. Very pleased to see that happen. Um, <laughs> I mean, we've got, we've got Stuttgart, which is the equivalent uh, 500 event uh, indoor clay. Uh, Shriontek top seed there. Sabalenka, the second seed. 
Coco Goff and Rabakina make up the top four seeds. I mean, this it's a smaller draw, but this is this is just loaded. I feel every everywhere you look, it is. And I would be fascinated to see if Raducanu can come through plus Kerber, mm. and there was a repeat of Ostapenko Raducanu because that was the match that actually made her realise she had to go and have those surgeries last year. And so I think that would be very interesting to see where her game is at Tasty. compared to last year and a very interesting, tasty contest, I think. We've got some other very interesting players there. We've got Sara Rani, as you say, coming through qualifying. Mm. Which is, we also have Coco Goff, who's yet to really kind of get going on the clay. So very interesting to see what sort of level players will have. And and Von Drusova as well. Von Drusova, she's still playing tennis, um, <laughs> which is a... a a tough first round draw. There's no easy mm. matches at, at this tournament. No, but um, we, we've also got a hat trick of 250 events. Uh, two on the ATP side. We've got the uh, the Munich Open, as well as the Tyriac Open in Bucharest, as well as Chris. You said Rouen in 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 France on the WTA side. I mean, just quickly, any anything standing out to you on the on the 250 draws? On the 250 draws, where am I looking? The prize money. Yes, indeed, indeed. I think. Um, they're, they're, I mean, the prize money is very interesting. They're all they're matching for the prize money. The Tyriac Open is trying to get its kind of first edition. So Alina's actually out there. So I'm fascinated to see what that is like because I do think mm. it looks a little bit, um, well, a little bit kind of completely uh, an unknown quantity. We don't know what to make of it. So it's been a little the while since it's been a tournament in Bucharest and I'm sure Alina will give us the verdict. Um, but sh- I mean, I'm just, it's too much to take in, Joel. Well, we'll we'll have to wait and see. I mean, I saw Jack Draper won today. Osaka is in Rouen. Sorry, I just saw that. Yeah. yeah. Jack Draper won, yes. Jack Draper won. He's won his 50th ATP Tour victory. So very, very good. Um, and yeah, as you said, Naomi Osaka, I think she got wild card into Rouen. She's coming down to the 250 level, which is... From from Japan. Mm. She said she never knew how far Paris, uh, France was from Japan. Um, she did a funny tweet about it. So I wonder if the jet lag will be there and how she will be playing. But I mean, it, credit for her for putting in the miles and, and getting back on the tennis court to get that ranking up for Paris. Yeah, so lots and lots to look forward to. But we're going to end our latest catch up there. Listeners, I hope you've enjoyed our latest episode of the Tennis Weekly podcast. Remember to subscribe to us to stay up to date on all the action to come from the ATP and WTA tours. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and all major podcasting platforms out there. And if you like what you're hearing, then make sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also follow us on social media or email the show. We are on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube and X. And the handle for all of those is Tennis Weekly Pod. You can also purchase Tennis Weekly merchandise at etsy.com slash shop slash Tennis Weekly podcast. You can email us a question for the mailbag at tennisweeklypod at gmail.com or do check out our website, tennisweekly.co.uk. And we will be back next week at Tennis Weekly HQ. So I hope you can join us for that. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from Kim. It's goodbye from Chris. Goodbye. (laughs) And it's goodbye from me. We'll see you again soon.